knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. The tears of a culturally rejected woman changed the outlook of all of Israel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And as we go through the Bible in one year, today we embark on one of the most tender and amazing stories in the whole Bible. Again, we're talking about a woman, and her name is Hannah. And she is in great despair because she's barren. And in her culture, that means she's a rejected woman. But she goes to God and God opens her womb. Today we're going to be focusing in 1 Samuel chapter 1 to 3 on this story, which I call the tears of Hannah. That woman and her tears and her pleading to God literally changed the course of ancient Israel and saved the nation through her son, the firstborn. His name was Samuel. What an amazing story. Mm -hmm. Corey uh, is here for Bible Archaeology. Corey? Yes, well today we are going to be taking a look at this city, the hometown of Hannah, which of course is the city of Rama. Uh, very good. Uh, actually the city of Samuel too. Also, do, mm -hmm. uh, do you know? Yes. Do you know how many more children that Hannah had after Samuel? And one of the favorite parts of this whole story, she made him Samuel. Uh, don't talk about it. Oh. Don't talk okay, about it. Okay, that's part of the Do You Know segment. I'm, <laughs> I'm giving it away. Hey, special hello as we get ready to go to Corey. Special hello to my great friends at Church on the Street in Phoenix, Arizona. We love you. We'll talk to you a little bit later. Let's study now. Today we begin studying the book of 1 Samuel. Now in the first three chapters, right as this historical narrative begins, we find ourselves in the city of Shiloh where the priestly family of Eli is ministering in the tent tabernacle. Now right now what you and I are going to do is actually trace some of the history and archaeology of this city to help better establish this historical record. Take a look at this. The book of Joshua tells us that the whole congregation of the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The city name Shiloh means tranquil or secure, and it was here that the tent tabernacle resided, housing the worship articles, the Ark of the Covenant, and the high priesthood. Judges 21 verse 19 gives us detailed travel directions to Shiloh, placing it on the east side of the major road that went from Bethel to Shechem. We are also told of a yearly pilgrimage to the tabernacle at Shiloh, which once resulted in a disturbing account of Benjamite men kidnapping women at the festival. Shiloh is also the scene of the history of Samuel's mother, Hannah, asking the Lord for a child. In 1 Samuel, it is Shiloh that becomes Samuel's home, and we are introduced to the inner workings of the tabernacle and the rebellious family of the high priest Eli. Archaeologists believe that they have successfully identified ancient Shiloh at a site called Kerbet Salon. Excavated at different intervals since 1926, the site has yielded some major finds. Evidence seems to suggest that Shiloh was a kind of religious center before and after Joshua's conquest. Large storage rooms that might have been part of the tabernacle complex have been found, yielding much pottery. 
Although the destruction of Shiloh isn't recorded in the Bible, it is mentioned by the later prophet Jeremiah, who uses Shiloh as a cautionary tale. Archaeology has revealed massive destruction of the site sometime around 1050 BC, which is just before the monarchy. This suggests that Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines as a part of the victory that allowed them to steal the Ark. Adding weight to this theory, the Bible tells us when the Philistines do return the Ark, it is not taken back to Shiloh. Again, the time of the judges and one of the wisest guys in the Bible was actually a wise gal, a woman. Now, her name is Hannah, who lived in the time of the judges of ancient Israel. Now, this time is about 1350 B.C. The tabernacle of Moses seemed to be set up at a place called Shiloh, which actually means peace and safety. Eli was the priest, but his sons were corrupt. His priesthood was flawed by the discard for God's sacred places and spaces. In this time, God sends the 13th judge of ancient Israel, and his name is Samuel. And he is one of the shining stars of a man of God in godless times. But Hannah, his wise mother, had much to do with Samuel. This is her story. Samuel 1, 1 through 18. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zothim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate 
and her face was no longer sad. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. We continue with the women heroes of the Bible, and today we study in 1 Samuel chapter 1. What a story. Today I call this the tears of Hannah. Literally, the grief of this woman uh, caught in a situation that was anything but godly, was not in a perfect situation by any means, yet she brings her grief to the tabernacle at Shiloh, and God turns her grief not only into personal joy, but turns her grief into the power to change Israel. Let's begin to read. Here is 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. He was the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf. He was an Ephraimite. And he had two wives living in polygamy. Not God's plan, but he had two wives, a culture of the day. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Pania. And Pania had children, but Hannah had no children. That was a curse in those days. Verse 3. Then this man went up from his city yearly to worship at the sacrifices of the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophnia and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. Verse 4. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Paniah, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he loved Hannah, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved her, although the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 6. And her rival provoked her severely, to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up into the house of the Lord that she was provoked, and therefore she wept, and she did not eat. Now this is the opening scenario of the birth of Samuel. So often in our deep pain, our deep pain often precedes powerful miracles of God because we become desperate for his touch. Beloved, listen carefully. Hannah not living in a good situation, not living in the perfect will of God, not by her own choice, but culture had, had done this to her. She had been extracted from God's perfect will and subjected by the culture. She had no choice. She was in pain and she was in sorrow. She was desperate for the touch of God. And there is something about that desperation that gets in us sometimes. When we become desperate for the touch of God, he begins to move his hand. Now listen, here's verse uh, 8 of 1 Samuel 1. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Hannah, am I not better to you than ten sons? You see, he didn't understand. He did not understand what was going on with Hannah. He did not understand the deep desires of her heart. And so often deep pain in our lives confuses those around us who do not understand. But listen, don't become frustrated with them. Why? Because God always understands. God always knows our thoughts and our feelings. And you may be there right now. You may be in a situation where your husband or your wife, or your family members, your father, or your mother, they don't understand what you're going through. They don't understand the desperation in your heart. And, and the loss of a sense of purpose, they don't get it. They don't know. Now, let me tell you something. God understands, and he knows our thoughts, and he knows our feelings. And God does not wipe us from the face of the map every time our feelings offend him. If we trust in Jesus, we are covered in the blood of Christ. But like a good shepherd, like a gentle shepherd, he takes us in that deep, dark moment of our Lack of, des or lack of uh, purpose and desperation, uh, uh, great floods of desperation, and he turns that into something. What? Here's what. Watch this now. This is 1 Samuel 9, verse 1, 9 to 18. So Hannah, here's what she did. She arose after she had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorstep of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. Have you ever been there? You might be there right now. As I'm reading this to you, you might be in bitterness of soul. And she was in bitterness of soul. So what did she do? Look at this. And she prayed to the Lord and she wept to the Lord in anguish. She didn't become bitter. She wept to the Lord in anguish. And then she made a vow. <laughs> and here's what she said. Oh, Lord, Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life. I call that a pre-offering. 
and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke with her heart, but only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. So Eli, he thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk, woman? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, you don't understand. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Eli didn't even understand that. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint, look at this line, out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Well, then Eli said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way, and she ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now listen carefully. Here it is. We close with this. In our deep pain, it is always right to come to Christ and pour out before him. Never hold back in the presence of the Lord. Beloved Hannah was rewarded. as She gave an offering before the son came. And when the son came, his name was Samuel, and he served in the house of the Lord and became the 13th judge of Israel. Hannah had other children after that. What a story. When we pour ourselves out to Jesus Christ, he hears us, but he also heals us. Samuel chapter 1, we find out that Samuel's parents come from the city of Ramah. Now later on in the book of Samuel, after Samuel grows up, the Bible tells us in chapter 7 and 8 that Samuel actually moves back to Ramah and functions there as a judge of Israel. So right now what you and I are going to do is take a look at the history within the biblical context of the city of Ramah and also take a look at some of its extra biblical history and even some archaeology. Take a look. The ancient city of Ramah is located five miles north of Jerusalem in a relatively central location. Because of this important location, it shows up in the biblical narrative. Ramah is the city from which the famous female judge of Israel, Deborah, leads the people. And it is also the home of the final judge of Israel, Samuel. In 1 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 16, the city of Ramah is used as a declaration of war by the king of the northern kingdom against the king of the southern kingdom. Ramah was located in the land belonging to the tribe of Benjamin, right on the border between the two kingdoms. It was strategically placed just to the east of a main road connecting the two kingdoms. It was on a trade route, a travel route. The king of the north began to build up and fortify Ramah. He was making it into a strong outpost so that he could effectively control entry and exit into both kingdoms. He was reinvigorating all of the old hostilities between the kingdoms, confident in his rule, confident in his allies. His plan, however, does not come to completion, and Ramah is brought back to its original state, but controversy at Rama was not over. Years later, during the lifetime of the prophet Jeremiah, Rama would be used as a type of prison camp by the Babylonian army. Having just destroyed what was left of the southern kingdom of Judah, they use Rama as a sorting center for the captive Israelites. The prisoners are cataloged and sent into exile. Today, there is a great battle for the minds of men and women. Pop culture is lost in its do-it-yourself religion and feel-good values. But we believe that the Bible offers a better way to live. 
And although many have distorted the Bible's principles in order to slander its meanings, still millions are healed by the life it brings to our world. Quick Study Television believes it's important to present the Bible daily in our present culture. Your contribution to this ministry is used for that purpose, for the production, distribution, and publication of the TV program, the print guide, and the website. And we need your help. Will you help us this month, especially? To write today and send your help, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada and the rest of the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also use our website, www.biblediscoverytv.com, and click on the Donate button. Okay, Janice, here we go for the Do You Know segment. So uh, we've got this very interesting time going on. So what's mm -hmm. up? Well, do you know how many more children Hannah had after she had Samuel? Okay, so Hannah, she is barren. Yes, for years. And she's rejected. She's part of a polygamous relationship, which is against God's law. But nevertheless, she goes to the temple. And she prays and she says, Lord, please remove this reproach from me. Mm -hmm. And Eli comes in and says, he sees her mouthing without talking, thinks yeah. she's drunk. That's right. So he scolds her and he said, she says, you don't understand. I'm not drunk. I'm sorrowful of soul. That's right. And then Eli, who is a, not a good priest, says, may whatever you request of the Lord be mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. And the authority was there and God gave her a little son, Samuel. That's right. All right, who is the famous boy we learn in Sunday school who... God talks to him yes. from the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, yes. so now, but then she has to give him up because that was part it's of the deal. It's such a story, a roller coaster of emotional. <laughs> it really is. Whew, it is. This story. In fact, we did a CD on it called The Tears of Hannah. And well, uh, it's about prayer. That's a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you want that CD, may, write to us uh, for a gift in any amount. We'll give it to you. Anyway, what we want to do, Corey, is figure out uh, how many more kids she had after. That's right, because right. Sam, she was Samuel. blessed with Samuel, but then... But then she had more children. Do you know how many more? Okay, I want to say that she had four children, but I, I, I'm struggling with she had three children after Samuel, so there's four altogether. She had four children, so there's five altogether. I'm going to say she had three children after Samuel, so that she has four altogether. But I'm not 100% I'm not sure, not sure. But that's what okay. I'm going to say. So you're saying three children? Because I was a little confused in that. I'm just saying that she had three children after Samuel. Okay, she's saying she had three children after Samuel. Okay, I'm not going to go against my own daughter. I can't mm -hmm. do that. So I'm, we're going to go with her. Wait. I'm, no, I'm going to stand and support Corey. All right. <laughs> well, actually, she had five children oh. after she had Samuel. She had three more sons, and she had two more daughters. So. But I still stand with you, Corey. In good times and bad, I'm standing Thanks, with you. Thanks, Dad. There you go. Thank so, you. So, so in this story, this tender story, and, and by the way, at, at first when you were talking and you were saying she was really, you know, held in less regard because of those times, she wasn't to her husband, Elkanah. In fact, he loved her and he felt badly for her and would always give her a double portion of, of, of things um, to her. Uh, but she was made fun of by... Uh, the competing wife. The competing she was trapped wife. in a polygamous relationship. Yes, she was. Which wasn't God's will. No, it was not. But in this story, uh, there was something that Hannah brought for Samuel each year. When she would come to Shiloh for the yearly sacrifices, she right. would bring something for Samuel. Do you know what that was? Corey, you almost you, said it at the beginning of the program. Do you know, Corey, what Hannah used to bring little Samuel after she yes. heart-wrenchingly gave yes. him up yes. to fulfill her vow? She, yes, yeah, she would bring him um, an ephod, a linen ephod, every time she would go see him. That's right. She so, did. So it's he an wasn't, amazing story. Yeah, Samuel wasn't in her home, but Samuel obviously never, her never heart. left her heart yeah. at all for one moment. And so this little boy served wearing a linen ephod Not even, even a as Levite. a little boy. That's right. And, and of course, the ephods, they were reserved for the priests yeah. and for the high priest. And, and this little boy, uh, the, the priest is there, Eli, but God is speaking to the boy because Eli's corrupt mm -hmm. along with his sons. Yeah. And so, you know, Eli goes, he's blind, he falls backwards and, and he destroys. Because during Eli's time, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. Yes, it was. And so God uses a child. Mm -hmm. He uses a little boy. Mm -hmm. uh, to restore the authority of his tabernacle. Can you imagine? And I love that Hannah knows the character of God because 
it's she gives Samuel on loan she to does. God. That's right, because they're together now in heaven. That's right. Uh, they're back together. Isn't that an amazing story? It is. Uh, There's another amazing story. Briefly, we're getting ready to go into call to prayer, but I would like you to, to pray for these people. Here is Amir. He is translating the quick study program. He's my voice in Urdu, which is the language of Pakistan. They're in Pakistan. This is a little studio in Pakistan we're working with. Here is uh, uh, Mewish. And she is doing Janice's voice mm -hmm. in Urdu. Here is another Mewish, and she is doing Corey's voice. And look at this young lady here. She is working very hard at translating so they can translate the scripture. Mm -hmm. So she's reading the scripture, and she's That's translating, great. and then she's reading the scripture. Look at that. That's all happening. Would you pray for the translations going on for to reach the Pakistani people and the people in West India? Thank you. You know, too often we have learned to dump our sorrow on others rather than to speak to the Lord. The problem is human nature cannot really heal human nature. When we have deep spiritual pain, it is God's wisdom at work in us when we pour ourselves out before the Lord. This is the secret that King David learned and we read it in the Psalms. God's wisdom is working in us when we realize that only our Lord can truly relieve the suffering of our deep spiritual pain. Therefore, today we pray, Lord, teach me the depth and the power of pouring myself out in prayer with my deepest thoughts to you and increase my trust in knowing you. It is our custom here on Quick Study Television to take you through the book of Proverbs as well as the Bible. Our reading today is Proverbs 11, verses 8 to 19, where it says, one of the lines, As righteousness leads to life, so he who pursues evil pursues it to his own death. Beloved, you have a choice. You really do. God knows you have a choice, and he will not invade that free will decision. Your choice is what you're going to do with the one called Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people use him as a swear word. I get it. And they kind of mock him and you think the church is irrelevant and, you know, it doesn't really have any meaning anymore. And, but what about that deep question in your heart, that dark darkness in your soul? You can't seem to really quench that. No matter what you do, how much money you make, who you sleep with, you can't quench that. So you do drugs or you do alcohol, you try to quench that. And beloved, may I say to you, the only answer is Jesus Christ according to the Bible. And I believe the Bible. Come to Jesus today. And give him your life and taste and see that he is good. Just pray and say, Jesus, I need you today. Help me. And he'll respond if you're serious. Remember that the Bible Discovery TV network is on the Roku box, which is sold in mass merchandisers like Walmart and Best Buy all over the world. Look for the Bible Discovery TV channel in the channel store.